We'll continue our lectures on spin dynamica. Just to remind you where we were, spin dynamica contains a set of packages to do with the quantum mechanics of spin systems, the spin dynamics of spin systems, routines for doing simulations and various other things. And we covered now the quantum mechanics part of spin dynamica, at least gave an introduction to it. So we looked at Hilbert space and Liouville space, how spin dynamica handles those different types of spaces. I gave some demonstrations of operators and super operators and how they can be represented as matrices in Hilbert space for operators and in Liouville space for super operators. Uh, what I'd like to do now is show you some of the spin dynamics aspects, so how spin dynamica enables one to calculate the, the time-dependent evolution of spin systems, which is what we need to do to simulate NMR experiments. And I'll, I'll mainly be dealing with this, the topic of generators, which is how we specify the, the driving force for spin evolution, which could be spin Hamiltonians or it could be relaxation superoperators and combinations thereof, and how those may be assembled into specifying events and how the system then propagates under, under those events. So this is the mechanism for setting up and simulating and analyzing NMR magnetic resonance experiments in general. And then I want to cover some of the techniques for simulating spin systems. Spin dynamic as it currently stands contains four main routines for doing simulations. So these have been set up so that the, the results of simulating magnetic resonance experiments become available with just a, a very minimum of user programming. So these are usually just one line commands which enable you to simulate rather complex experiments in ideal cases. So the internal problem of setting up the system so that Spin Dynamica knows what to do with it is to some extent handled internally. And these are things which are expanding as Spin Dynamica develops. Today I'll probably deal with mainly just the trajectory and the signal 1D routines. Trajectory allows one to follow the fate of different spin operator components through the evolution of a system and signal 1D, as its name implies, allow, enables one to simulate one-dimensional NMR spectra. These routines, transformation amplitude and transformation amplitude table, useful for calculating the performance of particular spin systems to do particular pulse sequences to do particular tasks. And I think I don't have time to cover them today. I want to mention that all simulation techniques are associated with an ensemble average routine which enables one to repeat simulations for an ensemble of different parameters and that's very useful for calculating for example powder averages in solid state NMR or averages of the distributions of some parameters in solution NMR for disordered systems and over space uh, so that one can simulate uh, imaging experiments so we'll see that as we go along today so we've handled how to start up spin dynamica. We've covered the topic of Hilbert space and spin operators, and we've covered the topic of Liouville space and super operators. So now let's look at propagation. Now a little bit of theory here. There's one equation which is central to spin dynamic, which uh, basically is the differential equation, a very simple differential equation, which determines how does a spin system or in fact an ensemble of spin systems, evolve in time. And that equation is called the Liouville von Neumann equation. And it has this appearance. So it's just the time derivative of the density operator. Rho, the density operator, is the way in statistical quantum mechanics that we specify the state of the ensemble of spin systems. So when we do NMR experiments, usually we have a large collection of formally identical spin systems, usually one system per molecule, and it would be too laborious to track the quantum mechanics of each individual spin system when we're dealing with a macroscopic number of systems. 
So there's a clever trick, which is the, the density operator, which is a way of writing down the state of the whole ensemble of systems. And it's an operator like any other operator of the type we've already covered. And we'll be looking into how to specify the density operator in Spin Dynamica. But having written it down, the differential equation for the density operator just simply says that the time derivative of the density operator is given by the density operator at that particular point in time, but with a superoperator acting on it. And this is called the Liouvillian superoperator. So L with a hat on. And basically, most of magnetic resonance can be reduced to the properties of this equation and its solutions. So the Liouvillian contains everything which governs how the spin system, what drives the evolution of the spin system. And it has two terms in it. It has a coherent term and an incoherent term. So coherent and incoherent means that for the coherent term, the driving force for the spin evolution is the same for all members of the spin ensemble, while for the incoherent term, then the, that driving force is different and, and fluctuates in time. But in both cases, you can represent the evolution by the superoperator. And actually, the coherent part is simply given by the spin Hamiltonian of the type we've already covered a little bit. And we'll see some more examples soon. It's given by the commutation superoperator, so that's the hat here. The commutation superoperator, the spin Hamiltonian, multiplied by a complex number minus i. So the coherent part of the Liouvillian is just given by minus i times the commutation superoperator of the spin Hamiltonian. And in general, that might be time dependent. So we might be interested in a, a rotating sample, as in solid state NMR, a flowing sample, a sample moving between different regions of magnetic field, in which case the Hamiltonian will be time dependent. But in some cases, it will not be time dependent. It can also be time dependent because of pulse sequences, which we apply as well. So the coherent part of the Liouvillian is time dependent because the Hamiltonian is time dependent because of the applied pulse sequences and or because the sample is rotating or moving. Then we have an incoherent part of the Liouvillian and that's given by the relaxation superoperator. In general we can have another part as well to do with uh, slow motion or chemical exchange but I'm not going to consider that in this lecture. So for efficiently fast fluctuating interactions, the incoherent part of the Liouvillian is given by the relaxation superoperator, which is called gamma, with a hat on to indicate that it's a superoperator. And all of these objects can be specified in spin dynamica. Having specified them, uh, we can solve the Liouville von Neumann equation uh, using a variety of algorithms which are internal to spin dynamica, which tries to choose algorithm according to the type of evolution which it's being asked to calculate. And I'm not going to go into the details there of which choices it makes. That's also a field which is developing as we, as we develop the calculation engine of spin dynamica. For the most part, you don't need to know it as an as a introductory user of spin dynamica. So to access this machinery, we need to access figure out how to specify the spin density operator and how to specify the different parts of the Liouvillian, the coherent part and the incoherent part. So now we can look at those things. So to start with the density operator, the spin density operator is defined mathematically through this equation. So what that means is that we have an ensemble of spin systems often a single spin system per molecule. And we have a very large number of them. Each spin system has a quantum state given by ket psi here. And if we take the product of ket psi by the bra state, we get an operator. 
And if we average that operator, that's the overbar here, over all members of the ensemble, that's the definition of the density operator. And one important feature of the density operator is that the trace of its matrix representation must be unity. That's essentially equivalent to a statement that the sum of all populations in the system should be unity. So a rigorously defined density operator has to have that property of unit trace. However, having said that, very often in NMR experiments in particular, we often are a little bit loose about that and we use density operators which don't have that property, just for convenience. So if we load here spin dynamica, in this case we set the system to two spins a half, then it would be common to start the evolution of the computation of spin evolution by using a density operator proportional to the IZ operator, as discussed last time. And in, in a great deal of NMR theory and textbooks, then this is actually how one, loosely speaking, starts the evolution of a spin system in thermal equilibrium. It's not rigorously true, though, because the, the trace of that density operator is not one. And we see that if we just evaluate the trace of its matrix representation, the trace is zero. So that's not actually technically a rigorous density operator, but it's convenient to choose this rather than the more rigorous formula for a density operator. And it's acceptable for spin systems which are only weakly polarized which is the case if one's not dealing with hyperpolarization experiments, for example. And spin dynamica accepts that as a density operator without any objection. But one should be aware that it's not the rigorous way of doing it. There are some cases where we do need a rigorous definition of a density operator, and spin dynamica does provide routines for doing that. So, for example, here we show how to specify the thermal equilibrium density operator for a spin system in a certain magnetic field and a certain temperature, defined in a rigorous way. So let's just have a look at uh, these routines here. So let's suppose we have a two spin a half system. And let's suppose for the sake of argument that we're dealing with a magnetic field of 11.74 Tesla with a temperature of 300 Kelvin. The first way to thing to set up is the Larmor frequency of the nuclear spins in that field. And there's a routine in spin dynamic, a Larmor frequency, which basically takes any isotope. In this case, the one here indicates protons in a given magnetic field. And this has been implemented for every isotope with spin in the periodic table and provides the Larmor frequency at that for spins of that type and in that field. The result is in radians per second. Often to visualize that, or to, we need conversion to Hertz, which we do by converting it by 2 pi. And then this um, appendage here in Mathematica just puts it in a convenient uh, numerical form for us with a power of 10. So this would be close to minus 500 megahertz for this particular field. As I said yesterday, I think the, the minus sign is technically correct here. This is a negative precession frequency for spins with positive gyromagnetic ratio gamma. And there are cases where that negative sign is important. So it's kept throughout spin dynamica. Having calculated the Larmor frequency omega zero, we can construct the laboratory frame Hamiltonian, which is just omega zero multiplied by IZ. So we have now the negative Larmor frequency multiplied by the Z operator. And since I didn't specify an index of a spin, then this becomes an implied sum over the two spins in the system, as discussed yesterday. So we've defined a laboratory frame Hamiltonian, and then we can use the thermal equilibrium density operator routine of spin dynamica to derive the thermal equilibrium density operator in the presence of that Hamiltonian at defined temperature. 
which was defined earlier to be 300 Kelvin. And that can be done for any Hamiltonian at any temperature. The re result we get is not immediately visible in an accessible form in this version of spin dynamica. It comes out as an operator symbol, but we can express that in terms of Cartesian operators by using the express operator routine, using specifying what sort of operators we'd like it to express the result in by specifying this Cartesian product operator basis. And then we see that the thermal equilibrium density operator is given by 0.25, the unity operator, and then small fractions of the two Z operators. And they represent the small amounts of thermal equilibrium spin order present in the spin system in a magnetic field at a reasonable temperature. This is a rigorous density operator. If we could evaluate the trace of the matrix representation of it, and the result should be unity, as it is indicating that this is a rigorously formulated density operator. Now, later on, when we do some simulations, we'll find that it will be very useful to normalize simulations. Again, the thermal equilibrium magnetization. We'll return to this, but this is uh, set up here. Here I've used the operator amplitude routine to extract from the thermal equilibrium density operator the part which is proportional to Iz. And the result is just these small numbers which are the coefficients of the Z operators. And we'll be using that thermal equilibrium magnetization later when doing some simulations. And again, we can use engineering form to express that. And we see it's about 20 ppm. So the coefficients of the Z operator in thermal equilibrium at this particular magnetic field, this particular temperature, is about 20 ppm, a very small number. So that was the thermal equilibrium density operator. And uh, I should just mention here that by default, the thermal equilibrium density operator routine assumes the high temperature approximation is valid. But one can also tell spin dynamic not to use that approximation. This actually shows what happens if one doesn't use the high temperature approximation. And then one gets a much more complicated form of the thermal equilibrium spin density operator, which includes these exponential factors. So th this is the correct form outside the high temperature approximation. And we can use Mathematica to simplify that expression. And in this case, it expresses this in, in terms of hyperbolic cosine and sine functions. So that form might be used if one's interested in magnetic resonance at very low temperatures, for example. Another way of specifying density operators is rather than specifying the, uh, the Hamiltonian and the temperature in hyperpolarized experiments, I start with a spin system which has, for example, 10% polarization, as might be coming out of a DNP apparatus. And then the question arises, how do you tell spin dynamica that the spin system has 10% polarization? And there are routines for doing that. The polarized density operator routine specifies density operators with given levels of spin polarization. So this particular routine here, the one here indicates 100% spin polarization. So this expression here is the density operator of an ensemble of two spin a half systems, which has been completely polarized. So all of the spins are aligned perfectly with the z-axis. And similarly, if it was only 50% polarization, this is how the density operator looks in this case. Another um, feature which is coming, becoming important now is singlet polarization. So this density operators which are polarized, in which the singlet states of spin pairs are, are polarized, are involved, for example, in parahydrogen enhanced experiments. So we also have implemented a routine which generates an initial density operator which is polarized either completely in the singlet state, which would be true if pure parahydrogen was used to generate the uh, polarization of the spin system, or for example, if one has 50% singlet polarization.
one can express the density operator this way. Okay, so that's the starting point essentially for spin dynamical simulations, the initial density operator, either expressed as, in a very simple way, as, as just an operator such as IZ, just remembering at the back of one's mind that that's not actually rigorous, but we can use it anyway. And that's usually a comfortable way of doing it for weakly polarized spin systems, which is the common situation in, in ordinary high field NMR without hyperpolarization. Or if we are dealing with hyperpolarized systems, then to define polarized density operators, or if we want to define in a rigorous way the thermal equilibrium density operator, then we can do that too. So that's the starting point of the Liouville von Neumann equation. We start with a density operator and now we propagate it. So now we have to define how to propagate a density operator. Uh, the key object here are generators. So these are the, you could think of as the driving forces for spin evolution. And in essence there are three different types. There's a null generator when there's essentially nothing happening, which in spin dynamica we use the Mathematica symbol non for a null generator. So this would be used if you have a delay in which you don't do anything. And then the real action happens when you either have a Hamiltonian, which could be time dependent or time independent, and a relaxation superoperator, which can also in fact be time dependent or time independent. In spin dynamica we have routines for uh, handling both time independent and time dependent generators. For example, if one wants to simulate magic angle spinning NMR, then the spin Hamiltonians are time dependent. And spin dynamica handles that case, but today I'm not going to deal with time dependent Hamiltonians in this lecture. So I'll restrict myself to time independent Hamiltonians and relaxation superoperators. So an example of a time independent Hamiltonian would be an equation of this form. Uh, this would be for a two spin a half system in which spin number one experiences a chemical shift turn proportional to omega one here spin number two experiences a chemical shift term proportional to omega two. These would be frequencies in radians per second expressed in the rotating frame. So relative to the carrier frequency of the spectrometer. And then a J coupling. So this would be an appropriate Hamiltonian for a two spin a half system in an isotropic liquid. So here we have I1 dot I2, the scalar coupling Hamiltonian between two spins. And in general you can write down any set of operators with symbolic or numerical coefficients, including dipolar couplings or J-couplings or quadrupole couplings or whatever, simply written as equations and used but then by spin dynamica. Then we have relaxation superoperators, and we'll be covering in the next lecture, I'll cover in more detail the topic of relaxation. Here, I just in order to give you an idea, I just want to introduce one object here, which has this very long name, uh, phenomenological relaxation superoperator. What phenomenological means is that you simply specify what the relaxation times are but without concerning oneself with the mechanism. So essentially the block equations, which are one of the, uh, the prime achievements of early NMR, analyzes the evolution of the spin system using relaxation times T1 and T2 as introduced by Bloch, but without at that point specifying where these relaxation times come from. And that's very convenient just to be able to do that, to analyze what relaxation does without worrying too much about its detailed microscopic mechanism. We can put in realistic relaxation superoperators, which correspond to real microscopic relaxation mechanisms as well, but to start with it's probably easier to use phenomenological relaxation uh, models. So this particular syntax here is, uh, would simply say that this would be the relaxation superoperator uh, 
for, for the spin system with equal values of T1 and T2, both equal to one second. There are uh, more complicated syntaxes one can use um, to express different situations, which are accessed by, if you execute any spin dynamic command with a question mark in front of it, then you get a usage message, which hopefully gives you some information about how to use that routine in general. So in this case, you can see that the phenomenological relaxation superoperator with just one argument gives the same relaxation time for all spins with T1 equals to T2. If you give it two arguments, then you specify differently the T1 and T2 for the spins. And to get into more details, you can go individually into each spin and specify a T1 and T2 value uh, for each spin in the system. And this constructs the uh, appropriate relaxation superoperator for you. So we'll be using those later. Now if we go back to the Liouville von Neumann equation, so just to recall this, the density operator evolves according to the Liouville von Neumann equation, which involves the Liouvillean superoperator. And the Liouvillean has two parts, a coherent part and an incoherent part. The coherent part is derived from the Hamiltonian by taking the commutation superoperator and multiplying by minus i. And the incoherent part is just the relaxation superoperator. But spin dynamica needs to know how to combine the coherent part when you specify the Hamiltonian with the incoherent part where you specify the relaxation. And that functionality is handled by a routine called combine generators, which actually has some complicated functionality when, especially when dealing with time-dependent generators, but that's, we're not going to deal with that here. But for example, if I ask Spin Dynamic to combine the Hamiltonian as a generator with a relaxation superoperator as a generator, then actually what you see here is that it's constructed a commutation superoperator for the Hamiltonian and multiplied it by minus i in order to construct the coherent part of the Liouvillean and then add that to the incoherent part of the Liouvillean. So you don't need to know the technicalities of this because essentially spin dynamica then just handles the combination of Hamiltonians and relaxation superoperators without your intervention. It just does that internally using this combined generators routine. But just occasionally one has to use this routine oneself when setting up the problem. So I show that to you now. So the basic story is if you have a Hamiltonian and a relaxation superoperator and you want to present to spin dynamic of the problem of what happens when you have a Hamiltonian and a relaxation at the same time, then you can do that using this combined generators routine. OK, so we have generators. When we calculate a pulse sequence in magnetic resonance, a pulse sequence consists of a set of events, pulse one, then a delay, pulse two, and so on. So spin dynamica needs to um, have a language for setting up such sequences of events. And actually, spin dynamica recognizes two sorts of events, events which have finite duration, so that is represented in spin dynamica by a list, so that's the curly bracket here, in which the first element in the list is the generator, so that can be the Hamiltonian or a relaxation superoperator or whatever, and then, then just the duration, how long that event lasts. So that would be an event in spin dynamica. For example, Hamiltonian lasting for a certain time. Spin Dynamica can also handle instantaneous events which don't last any time and they're expressed as a superoperator. So one example could be a rotation superoperator. So if you simply want to rotate the spins instant instantaneously, which is essentially what an ideal infinitely short pulse does, then you can tell Spin Dynamica to do that by using a rotation superoperator. Another common event of this type 
is you want to tell spin dynamica that at a particular moment in time, suppress all terms in the density operator which don't belong to a certain coherence order, or in general, set of coherence orders. Because that's very often how we express the result of doing a phase cycle in magnetic resonance. So that's done just by including a coherence order filtration superoperator in this list of events. And uh, we'll probably see some examples of that. So a single event can either be instantaneous, in which case it's just a superoperator, or finite, in which case it's a pair of a generator paired with how long that generator acts for. And now we can assemble a list of events, uh, a sequence of events, just by chaining these events together in chronological order. So let's just see, so this is best described just by an example. So an example of a composite pulse then uh, would be expressed by this list of events here. So what is this? So it's a list of three events. Each one is another list with two elements. The first element in the list is the Hamiltonian. And in this case, what's been written here is um, a rotating frame Hamiltonian proportional to Ix. That implies an RF field with phase zero with a magnitude of 1 kilohertz, that's the 2 pi times 10 cubed, meaning 1 kilohertz. So that would be an RF field providing with an amplitude which gives a mutation frequency of 1 kilohertz, acting for 250 microseconds. So that would be a very explicit way of specifying a radio frequency pulse. Apply a RF field at 1 kilohertz along the x-axis for 250 microseconds. And follow that by a pulse with a phase shift, so we use the Y operator instead. Again, same amplitude in this case, uh, but twice the duration, 500 microseconds. And then the third pulse, which is the same as the first one. So again, we, we specify a list of events just as a set of Hamiltonian duration pairs. So that will be a way of specifying a composite pulse in a very explicit way. And when executed, then uh, you see the expansion in terms of the spin operators here. Because uh, at the moment I'm, I have a system of two spins a half, each operator Ix by default expands into the sum of the involved spins. Now we may want to do that without thinking too hard ourselves about how long the duration should be and so on. And there's different ways of doing that. One way is to do a little bit of programming here. So I just give an example here. Here I'm saying that the mutation frequency, that's the amplitude of the field expressed as a frequency, is one kilohertz. From that I can derive the 360 degree pulse duration by taking 2 pi divided by the mutation frequency. And from the 360 degree pulse duration, I could define the 90 degree pulse duration just dividing it by 4, and the 180 by dividing it by 2, and then using those symbols in the definition of the composite pulse. The result is the same. But it's probably a bit easier to see uh, what one's actually doing there. Now I'll come, I'll come in a bit to um, a new package in Spin Dynamica which has been recently introduced, which is still under development at this, at, at this time, in which we use more pulse sequence-like language to define these things. And I'll sh show some examples of that. But if one wants to do it explicitly using the Hamiltonians and the duration, then this is how to do it. And just to emphasize, these Hamiltonians can be absolutely any operator or relaxation superoperator and so on. This would be another example, a spin echo sequence. 
So here I've used a little bit of Mathematica syntax for defining a function. So without going into the technicalities of Mathematica, this is how you do it. This is something which one is best to investigate in the Mathematica website or the help files, how to define functions. But this, just by example, what one's defined here is a pattern. Here one's defined a symbol saying spin echo which if it acts on a single object, so this underscore here indicates a pattern, then substitute that pattern by this, in which the object which is matched then appears and is called here tau, is then uh, appears here in the list. So here I've just used a smaller amount of mathematical programming to define uh, tell Mathematica to match a pattern and then substitute it by something else. So once this has been executed, then whenever uh, Mathematica sees spin echo with a single argument, it substitutes it by, by this, substituting the argument in. So spin echo now of one second would now have nothing for half a second. So that's a delay a null generator, none. In this case, I've used the rotation super operator to indicate an instantaneous rotation by pi around the x-axis. So I haven't bothered here with a finite duration pulse. This would represent an infinitely short pulse uh, and infinitely ideal generating an instantaneous pi rotation. And then again, a null generator acting for half a second. So that would be just the way of defining a spin echo sequence. And of course, you can assemble arbitrary complicated pulse sequences using this type of syntax. Now, to facilitate this process, and this is still under development to some extent, but uh, we've implemented a pulse sequence object which lets one specify these event lists in a more convenient way. So this will be a pulse sequence object containing three pulses, the flip angles and phases of the pulses are indicated, uh, but the nutation frequency of the pulse, the amplitude of the pulse can be specified and then it calculates the durations needed to do that appropriately. So that's um, somewhat more convenient um, in some cases. And there are pulse objects, there are delay objects, and so on. And I think we'll see some examples of that later. Let me just proceed now and show a little bit how those um, objects are used. So. I covered now how to define the density operator, which is the start of the propagation, and how to define the sequences of events under which the system should propagate. So I'll now introduce you to one of the central spin dynamic routines, but actually not one which you often need to use yourself, because it's usually just called by um, the simulation routines, which I'm going to cover after the break. But sometimes you do need to access, or it's convenient to access, this routine, which is called n-propagate. It's the numerical propagation routine, which is the solution of the differential equation, the Liouville von Neumann equation. So basically, n-propagate performs the task of starting with a given density operator, and propagating it through an arbitrary sequence of events and then returns the final density operator. So we can look at our composite pulse again. So, and this gives you an example. So we, in this case, have just set the spin system to a single spin a half. The composite pulse here has been defined in, as described above. Here I've used the pulse sequence function, which enables you to to assemble a sequence of events using specifications which are sort of user-friendly specifications, 
a pulse with a certain flip angle and a certain uh, phase. Three of them chain together here. And for the whole pulse sequence here, I've used a global specification saying that the nutation frequency should be one kilohertz. And then the uh, routine then calculates the appropriate durations of the events to, to make, that, uh, make that correct. So that would be now the composite pulse. And I'm not going to trouble with what this output here means. It's maybe at, the, at this point not so, not very relevant. It's internal, let's say, to spin dynamica. But that's now defined a composite pulse sequence of events. And here I just propagate using n propagate is the propagation routine. This syntax simply means propagate a density operator iz through a composite pulse and return the result. It set up some operator bases and so on. This again is internal to spin dynamic. You don't need to worry about it. And unsurprisingly, it generates the result that it's generated minus iz. So the composite pulse has inverted the magnetization. And that's all there is to it. And propagate takes a sequence of events, which each of which can be a superoperator for an instantaneous transformation, or a pair of a generator with its duration for an event which lasts a certain time. In general, the generators may be time dependent, although I didn't cover that here. And simply solves the Liouville von Neumann equation to, and returns the final density operator. And we'll see some more examples of that later. Now, there's one topic I should co cover here, though. A very common problem in um, magnetic resonance is one specifies, as here, events which one applies from outside the spin system, the pulse sequence. So one can specify the Hamiltonian for the interaction of the spins with the field, and so on. But when the system evolves, that's not the only thing which a spin system sees. It also sees the internal Hamiltonian governing the coupling of spins with each other and anything else which is going on. So it would be possible, for example, to add that Hamilton those Hamiltonians into each event. So then the Hamiltonian specifying each event would have to be the internal Hamiltonian, chemical shifts, spin-spin couplings, and also the RF field. And one would then have to do that for every event. And that would be inconvenient. So we've implemented um, a symbol called background generator. And this is basically used from now on a lot in all of the simulation routines. This basically tells spin dynamica that when you're doing a propagation, assume that as well as the Hamiltonians or relaxation or whatever, which is specified within each event, you also in the background have something else going on and take that into account. So very often, the events then specify a pulse sequence while the background generator specifies relaxation or internal Hamiltonians. Uh, but in fact, one's free to do, use these routines as, in other ways as well. But that's the usual way of doing it. So a simple example here might be, uh, again, if you have a, we do a composite pulse again. So this is the same specification for a composite pulse using the pulse sequence routine in which we've specified that the pulses have a finite amplitude given in this case by nutation frequency of one kilohertz. And suppose we're interested in analyzing what such a pulse sequence does but in the presence of a resonance offset. Well the resonance offset adds another term to the Hamiltonian, and that term has to be active during all the events. So we could add them, add it individually into each event, but it's more convenient to use the background generator. So here I do the propagation again. So propagates 
during the composite pulse, starting with the IZ density operator, but in the presence of a background generator, which in this case is a resonance offset. This uh, indicates interaction with a field along the Z axis, that's the IZ, with magnitude in this case one kilohertz. So this would be saying propagate during the composite pulse but with a resonance offset of one kilohertz and start with a density operator IZ. And this time we don't get just minus IZ, we get some extra terms as well and that's because the composite pulse doesn't work perfectly when you have a resonance offset. Here's another example. So again, let's just look at a single spin a half system. Here, I just have a delay doing nothing for 200 microseconds. That's part of a pulse sequence object. I start with IX, that's transverse magnetization. But evolve it in the presence of a resonance offset. So that's the one kilohertz IZ term. And we expect the transverse magnetization to process under the resonance offset and that's what happens. We get a mixture of I1X and I1Y because the magnetization is precessed. So that was just precession under a delay. If we make a spin echo then we expect that precession to be refocused. So again I have I've, here I've used the same thing as before, a, a spin echo object defined as a pulse sequence consisting of a delay, a pulse, and then a delay. And now propagates not in term using just the delay, but using the spin echo. And this time I get just back to the initial IX term because the spin echo has refocused the resonance offset. We can see this more clearly when we use trajectory later. And then we can do something a little bit more complicated. Uh, let's uh, introduce some coupling terms. So let's set up a two-spin system. Suppose one of them is a proton, the other is a carbon-13. Let's suppose that there's a 150 hertz J coupling between them. I can do a little internal calculation here. Set up a delay or a duration tau J which is 1 over 2j, and then set up a Hamiltonian which consists of the uh, j coupling between the, these two nuclei, and since they have different isotopic types, I can use the, just the I1z, I2z form of the Hamiltonian. So we can see that the tau j, this 1 over 2j delay here, is 1 300th of a second. If I want to know what that is in in microseconds or whatever, I can just evaluate it numerically. That's the n, and then take the engineering form. So that would be 3.33 milliseconds. So I've defined the Hamiltonian for the coupling I'm needing the pulse sequence, 1 over 2j. So I can define an inept pulse sequence. Here I've defined it. Again, I use this syntax in Mathematica for defining a pattern. This, after execution, this says, whenever Mathematica sees now the symbol inept with one argument, it constructs a pulse sequence in which that argument becomes a delay here, in this case. So what this is saying is a pulse on spin number one, that was the proton, 90 degree pulse phase X, give a delay, pulse on spin number one, the proton again, but this time with phase Y, both pulses with flip angle pi over 2, that means 90 degrees. And then do a pulse on the uh, second spin, for example, carbon 13, again 90 degrees, but with phase X. So that would be a very simple version of the inept pulse sequence, re reduced to its basic form, basically. So if I, if I asked for inept with... Um, half a second delay, then 
it then constructs this pulse sequence object with a sequence of pulses and then uh, doing nothing for half a second and so on. So let's do a simple calculation. We start with Z magnetization on spin number one, that was the proton. And one propagates using N propagate using the inept sequence, but with a delay given by tau j, which was this 1 over 2j, in this case 3.33 milliseconds, designed to match the j coupling correctly. And while the inept sequence is going on, then I should always have a coupling active, which is this background generator given by HJ, which in this case is the J-coupling Hamiltonian between the two spins. And the result I've expressed in Cartesian product operators. And we get then the antiphase term with Y magnetization on spin number two, but now antiphase with respect to spin number one. And we can make that a little more complicated by programming a, a refocused inept sequence, which now involves more pulses and delays. This time um, a 90 on the X, a delay. Now a pi pulse on both spins, one and two. Um, 90 degree pulses on one, on spin number one, spin number two, and then another spin echo at the end. At this point, you see that the refocused inept symbol is blue. That means that Mathematica doesn't yet know what to do with that. But then having executed the routine, it turns black, which means a pattern has now been associated with that symbol. So from now on in the session, whenever Mathematica sees refocused inept followed by one argument, then it replaces by, by this set of symbols. And again, we can now propagate I1Z through the refocused inept sequence and the result is I2X indicating that the magnetization, the angular momentum has been transferred from protons to if we want carbon-13 as expected for this type of sequence. So that gives you the basic mechanisms of how to propagate density operators in spin dynamica. You need to define the initial density operator which can either be done just by using any operator without worrying about the, rigor the, the rigorousness of that. Or if one wants to use a rigorous density operator, there are those routines for defining thermal equilibrium density operators or density operators with a certain degree of polarization. We've governed how to set up sequences of events, either by specifying pairs of generators together with durations, or by specifying a superoperator. And then how to use n-propagate to solve the Liouville von Neumann equation and the use of the background generator symbol to tell spin dynamica that a particular Hamiltonian or relaxation superoperator should be active during the propagation without specifying it individually for every event. So after the break, we'll go on to some simulation routines.